So hello everyone. Today our guest is Julio de Vicente from the University Carlos III in Madrid. So let me say a few words about Julio. So Julio did his uh, PhD in 2008 at the other University of uh, Madrid. In fact, you have three universities there, no? It seems. Well, so there we was... have several, more than three actually. Then he did two postdocs, uh, one at the Autonomous University of Barcelona, in the quantum information group there, the second one in the group of Barbara Kraus at the University of uh, Innsbruck. And since 2013, he's a professor at the University Carlos III in Madrid. And uh, well, Julio's expertise is uh, covers entanglement and non-locality. And today he will tell us uh, about one of his uh, new results on how to create genuine uh, non-locality in quantum networks. So Julio, let's Okay, explore. thank you very the much. Thank you very much. Thanks for the nice introduction. Actually, I know Remick for quite some years. We both started our postdocs in Barcelona at the same time. I'm very happy now to speak here in this seminar, though it has to be online, but maybe I can visit a better time if the situation you can, you can, for sure. keeps improving. So as uh, Remick said, I'm going to speak about uh, genuine multiparallel entanglement and non-locality in pair entangled network states. This is all the results I'm going to talk about here are joint work with uh, Carlos Palazuelos, which is also in Madrid in Universidad Complutense. And many of the results were also done together with uh, Patricia Contreras Tejada, who recently finished her PhD, which was supervised by Carlos Andy. Okay, so... Um, well, starting with a bit of uh, motivation, well, I guess it's well known to everybody here. Well, multi-bital entangled states uh, play a crucial role in quantum information theory and the manipulation is very important for the development for quantum technologies. But, well, of course, uh, preparing entangled states is hard and moreover, this involves arbitrarily many distant parties. This requires joint quantum control over very fragile objects in uh, at long distance. Okay. Well, the starting point in, in this works is, well, arguably the probably most uh, feasible way to do so experimentally is instead to controlling a, 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 a fully a, a, a join the joint quantum state of many parties, what one can do instead is distribute bipartite entanglement via node-to-node -node protocols, given the structure, giving rise to the structure of a network, of a connected network. And somehow you, you have managed to create an, an, a joint entangled state for n parties, but using as building blocks only uh, bipartite entanglement node-to-node. -node, okay? So this is, um, at least uh, informally, uh, maybe I give a, a, a more clear definition later, what we call a parent angle network state or for short, a pen state. Okay, so, so the idea is that, uh, well, parties one and two might share some bipartite entangled state, then two might share an entangled state with four as well and with three and so on, creating this uh, structure of some network. This you have here some example with uh, six parties. And you see what the, uh, it, it might be that uh, some parties only hold one particle, like uh, party one in here, or two particles, like party four in here, or more parties, like uh, more particles, like party two and three in here. But this is a bit irrelevant. So in order to somehow to <clears throat> to represent this situation, what I'm going to use is directly write down the graph that, as you see here on the right hand side, that provides a connection pattern. So pen states are bipartite. Uh, are bipartite, uh, sorry, are multipartite states that arise from, by sharing bipartite states follow, uh, following the pattern of a given graph. And, and, and this is how I'm going to denote it, okay? Ah, by the way, if you, if you have any question, uh, please don't hesitate to interrupt me and make this uh, online talk a bit more uh, interactive. Okay, so what we might think now is, okay, the, it, clearly this is a very particular class of multipartite states. Not all multipartite states can be written in this form, okay? So if we are going to study just the states prepared in this form, we might ask ourselves, well, is this sufficient for all purposes? Is, is this good enough? Since this is a very restricted and a very particular class of multipartite states. 
And the answer is actually yes, okay? Because if the quality of node-to-node -node entanglement is good enough, think for instance of maximally entangled states of sufficiently large dimension, if we take for granted, which is the, the usual paradigm one, one considers in the entanglement theory, that we can implement LOCC protocols, local operations and classical communication, then starting from such a state by LOCC, we can prepare any part, any part state that we would like, because simply what we can do is prepare the state that we want locally and then use the, the, maxima, the maximally entangled states that, that the parties share to teleport them so that at the end of the day, the parties end up sharing the empartite state that we want. Okay? And this we can do for any empartite state is if, as I was saying, the, the quality of the node-to-node -node entanglement is good enough if they share sufficient uh, many pairs of, uh, of maximally entangled states. So you see, if in principle, if some laboratory manages to, to uh, control to perfection these uh, schemes, maybe they cannot uh, prepare in principle empartite states at will, but they are uh, able to distribute bipartite entanglement at will. If the quality of this bipartite entanglement can be as good as we want, then this is good enough for any purpose. Okay, and this is why, uh, or this is one of the reasons why many people are studying now protocols over quantum networks. Okay, if you want to read, read more about what's going on there, this is a recent and very good review paper. Okay, so <clears throat> in these words or the, and the results I'm going to uh, present in here, uh, what we wanted was to understand the, the power and the properties of our pen states as multipartite quantum resources from the point of view of entanglement theory. Okay? And in particular, the questions we wanted to answer was, well, to which extent pen states display genuine multipartite quantum features, such as entanglement and non-locality, depending on the quality of the bipartite entanglement shared and on the network topology. Okay? So these states in principle can be as good as we, as we want. We want to study how good they can be from the point of view of entanglement theory, how well they can display genuine multipartite entanglement and genuine multipartite locality as a function of the, of the, let's say, two parameters that matter here. What is the quality of the entanglement shared and what is the, the connection pattern? And in addition to this, as I will discuss later if, if time allows, Another reason why we wanted to study this is because uh, pen states constitute a, a particular subclass of multipartite states, which has well-defined mathematical properties one can work with that actually turn out to offer, like, a, as, as I write in here, a rich playground to study the complex phenomenology of entanglement and non-locality in many body systems. So the idea here is that bipartite entanglement and bipartite non-locality are much more developed than their multipartite counterparts. So exploiting the underlying bipartite structure in, in pen states, as we are going to see, they become a very, very useful tools to answer questions about multipartite entanglement and multipartite non-locality. Okay, so this is actually a research line in which I'm quite involved in the last two years or so. Um, and I, well, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in all these kind of questions. I'm still working in this. I have several results. So what I thought for this talk is that, well, instead of presenting just one result and then be able to go into the technical details, what I'm going to do is more give you a list of uh, some results and questions that we have uh, in this setting. And instead, well, I won't have a lot of time to enter into technical details. I will just offer some very hand wavy ideas of, of, how, of the proofs of these results. But if you want to know more about it, well, I will be very happy to discuss later today or at some other point if, if we run out of time. Okay, so then uh, let's get to it. Well, let's start smoothly. I guess most of you are familiar with these definitions, but just to have it clear, if uh, we first consider bipartite, the bipartite setting for simplicity, well, as I guess everybody knows, we say that a bipartite pure state in the, uh, of two parties, let's say it's a, a, 
a vector in the tensor product of the Hilbert space of each uh, local uh, party H1 and H2 is separable if it can be written as the tensor product of, of two pure states in each uh, uh, local Hilbert space. Okay? And otherwise, we say that it's entangled. And now in the same way as uh, the set of all states is defined as the convex hull of the set of pure states, the set of uh, separable states is defined as the convex hull of the set uh, of, of the separable pure states. Okay? So in other words, a general may be mixed bipartite state with density matrix rho on the tensor product Hilbert space H1, tensor product H2 is separable if it can be written as you seen here as a convex combination of pure separable states. So, well, as, uh, this means that then the set of separable states is convex, so it's a convex subset of the convex set of all states. As I guess most of you know, well, this deciding whether a state is separable or not, deciding whether it belongs to this convex subset is known to be a computationally hard problem, but this is a problem that has been long studied. There are many techniques, many sufficient or necessary conditions to decide if a state is entangled or not. And uh, well, I won't get much into these details. I guess you are familiar with them. So for instance, we can use uh, witnesses that are hyperplanes that separate entangled states from uh, separable states and other, many other techniques. Okay, so this is the bipartite case. What happens in the multipartite case? Well, just to fix some notation throughout this talk, n is going to be the number of parties. So the total Hilbert space is going to be the tensor product of H1 and so on up to Hn, okay? And I'm following the computer science notation. I'm going to denote by this symbol here, the first n natural numbers. So this is, I label the parties by the first n natural numbers, and this is the set of the first n natural numbers. Okay, so the first that one can define in the multipartite scenario is a state, when a state is fully separable, okay? And this means that it can be written again as a convex combination of few states that fully factorize for each of the n parties, okay? In general, if a state is not fully separable, then it is said to be entangled. However, you see, if a state is entangled, according to this definition, this does not mean that it's really entangled in, the entanglement really involves all the parties because it just prepares some entangled state between the first, say, the first two parties and, and separate with the rest. Of course, it, it doesn't fulfill this definition. It is entangled, yet the entanglement is not really multipartite. It only involves two parties. Okay? So in order to cope with this, this is why one introduces the definition of a genuine multipartite entanglement. Okay, in order uh, to define this, let me introduce a, a couple of definitions. Okay, so first we're going to see that given some uh, non-empty strict subset of the, of, uh, of the set of M parties, we say that a state is separable in the bipartition M and its complement if it, if it can be written as a convex combination of pure states such that they factorize in the M versus complement of M splitting, okay? Like I, I write in here. <coughs> okay. And then the union of, of all the states that are separable with respect to some bipartition is what I call the cell of the set of partially separable states. Okay, states that are separable at least with respect to one bipartition. The, what is interesting here is that now this, the union of all these sets needs not be convex. And then I call the convex hull of the set of partially separable states, the set of biseparable states. Okay? And then if I state is not biseparable, then that is what we define to be genuine multipartite entangled or for short GME. Okay? So if I state is not GME, if it's biseparable, then as you see in here, this means that it can be written as a mixture of partially separable states, maybe along different bipartition, okay? So I can, if I say this by separable, if it's not GME, I can obtain it by mixing partially separable states. So it can be written as a convex combination of states that are separable in some partition. Okay, so basically what you have is a structure of, of convex sets that looks something like this. I hope you can see this, so where we have fully separable states, and then we have partially, uh, 
partially separable states according across some bipartition in red, across some other bipartition in yellow, across some other bipartition in here. And now the convex hull of this uh, of these sets is what we call the set of bi-separable states. So it will include certain points that are not partially separable. And this is what we call bi-separable. And any state that is not bi-separable, then it's said to be GME. Okay, and it is well known that all these inclusions are strict. Okay, so fully separable states are strictly included in partially separable states, which are strictly included in the set of bi-separable states. So you see somehow, right, as if, you, if you follow the, the idea given in this picture, that uh, then GME, this, GME displays one of the strongest forms of entanglement that is uh, truly multipartite. And actually, well, it has been studied for long, and it's known that it's indeed necessary for certain tasks, like uh, for conference key agreement to, to be able to have a multipartite secret cryptographic key. It's also known that it's necessary for maximum sensitivity in quantum methodology and, 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 and other results that I'm not going to comment in here. Okay, so this is what comes to generate multipartite entanglement. Then we can play the same game with non-locality, but I'm going to be fast faster in here. I think most of you are familiar with non-locality. So in, in, this, in this case, what we consider is the conditional probability distributions that arise from measuring locally by each party an empartite state row. Okay? So we have possible inputs xi for party i and output that I label by ai for party i. Each party measures a different POVM based on the input XI that gets different outputs AI. And this is how one obtains the conditional probability distribution. Okay. And now with this object in here, we can again play the same game. That's, can this be written as a convex combination of conditional probability distribution that factorize? Then for two parties, this defines what is local and what is non-local. Then for the many party case. Now, can this be written as a complex combination of conditional probability distributions that fully factorize? This would give rise to the set of fully local states. And in particular, I'm in, I'm in um, sorry, distributions. And in this case, I'm particularly interested in the case of genuine multipartite non local or GMNL for short pro conditional probability distributions, which on the analogy of what I just discussed. These are the conditional probability distributions that can be written as a convex combination of conditional probability distributions that factorize in some bipartition of the parties. Okay. The first time this definition was considered by Svetlichny, he didn't put any restriction on these objects in here, PM and PM bar. But uh, later on, this was realized that uh, this leads to certain inconsistencies. So for quite some years now, it is a standard to ask that this, uh, this probability distributions here for the subsets of parties are not signaling. And this is the definition I'm going to follow in here. And then of course, we say that a, a state, a multipartite state is GMNL if there exists measurements that lead to a GMNL conditional probability distribution, okay? So this is the introduction and the definitions, probably most of you already knew them, but just to make sure that everybody knows what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, well, let me also- okay, Can I have mention. a question? Yes, sure. Short question. So, so you consider only probability distributions that are uh, not signaling, but maybe it also makes sense to consider those that are quantum, no? Because yes, I mean, some people do this, but uh, in principle, this is uh, this then uh, not be able to be written in, the, in this form with the constriction that you say, it's uh, it's less demanding, let's say. Yeah, exactly. But uh, some people consider this when you when they want to consider like uh, device independent verification of entanglement, mm -hmm. because you assume that uh, you you have an underlying theory which is quantum theory. Mm -hmm. You just don't want to assume or you don't have full control of what you're measuring. You might make mistakes, and this in this way, you can uh, verify GME uh, device independently. Uh, th this definition is more natural if you think about really like non-locality uh, from from the basic or from the more fundamental point of view. You just want to make sure that this is genuinely multipartite 
without making any explicit reference to an underlying theory. Okay. Yes, but I, I just want to, uh, what, what, yes, sure, I agree, but I just wanted to say that if you consider quantum uh, probability distributions, then your results should be stronger even, no? Because it's uh, even, it's always- Yeah, of course, if something is not GMNL according to this definition yes. here, it's not GMNL according to the other one, yes. Yeah, I, I'm just saying that I follow this one because I think it's more it's uh, it's um, it's closer to Bell's spirit in the sense that you consider non-locality without making any reference to an underlying theory. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to ask if I understand well. So for example, like uh, so it might be that like the that according to this definition, let's say three par three paratide probability distribution that on two parties is quantum uh, might be uh, might be uh, genuine multiparatite no not or not. Yes, you you could ha you have okay. quantum you have quantum states that are genuinely multiparatite non local. Yes. So there are quantum no, no, states. Sure, sure, sure. But I mean like as assume that I that my quantum states they are actually uh, like bisepherable. Yes. Like I, with, like I have like partition like one, two, and three, and like I have some entanglement between one and two. And then it might happen that statistics can it happen that statistics from such a bisepherable state are actually genuinely multipartite non-local in your definition? No. No. This was actually uh, what I'm going, well, exactly what I'm going okay. to say now. Okay. So, <clears throat> well, of course, one is interested in these things. You know this from the point of view of the foundation of quantum theory. This is the content of Bell's theorem. And also when one considers quantum information in the device dependent scenario. And then uh, going into the direction of Michal's uh, question. Well, in, if you think of the barbarite scenario, is well known and very easy to see that separable states cannot lead to non-local correlations. However, a, a really breakthrough result in this field is that the converse is not true. Just the fact that you have entanglement doesn't guarantee that you're going to, that you can extract non-local correlations. There are entangled states such that no matter which measurements you choose, you always obtain local uh, conditional probability distributions. Uh, the analogous situation holds in a multipartite scenario. So now answering Michal's question, GMNL requires GME states. Okay, so if you have a bi-separable state, you can never obtain GMNL conditional probability distributions. You need to have GME states. But as in the bipartite case, GMNL is stronger. Okay, it is known that there exists genuine multipartite multi entangled states for any number of parties that nevertheless are are local in this sense. They cannot display GMNL. This was actually a result by Remick. And this was the first construction of, of such thing. There have been more, more constructions later. Okay, so now going back to my motivation when I said that I want to study to, uh, to which extent Penn states display general multipartite features. After in introducing these definitions, now the question is more precise. What I want to study is when are these Penn states GME and when are they even show a stronger non-local and um, non um, a stronger correlations and then they are moreover GMNL, okay? Depending on the quality of entanglement shared and the network topology. So let me start with a case that I call, let's say, ideal networks. These are the case of pure networks, okay? When the, uh, when the parties share pure states. Okay, so this uh, quite schematically, now I've changed from raw to psi uh, signaling here that now what they are sharing is, uh, is um, pure states. Okay. So, well, in this case, actually it turns out that the question of when is a Penn State GME is uh, trivial. Okay, it's very easy to answer. It's given here in this uh, very simple observation. It happens that any pure Penn State in a connected network is GME. Okay, so no matter how entangled the pure states that they share are and what is the topology of the network, as long as the network is connected, any such a state is GME. And the reason that is very easy to see is because, well, a, a, a state <coughs> is bisepherable for pure states, 
if and only if it is partially separable, because we are talking about extremal states, so they cannot be written as convex combinations of states. Okay? So it can only be biseparable if it is partially separable, if it's separable in some bipartition. Okay? But if I take any bipartition in here and the graph that uh, gives the connection pattern is connected, then I'm going to cross at least one edge. I'm going to cross at least one pure state. So the reduction that I get, the part corresponding to the reduced state of the state that I cross is going to be mixed. Okay? Hence, it cannot be written, it cannot be a product state, and then it, it cannot be that it is biseparable, it has to be TME. Okay? So in this case, the question is trivial, it's very easy to answer, or in principle, it's good. So as if I distribute pure states, as long as I distribute, uh, as I have entanglement, then the corresponding network will have genuine multipartite entanglement. So the only question here that is not clear what happens is, can these states be moreover genuinely multipartite non-local? And you know, uh, before going into this, then let me show a bit what were the previous results regarding non-locality of pure states. Well, I said before that not all in, all in, in the bipartite case, not all entangled states are non-local. Uh, this was uh, uh, shown by Werner in 1989, but in 1991, uh, Gizan proved in what is now sometimes referred to as Gizan's theorem, that for pure state case, it is actually the case. So uh, for pure bipartite, any pure bipartite entangled states is non locked. Okay. Actually, they violate the simplest uh, Bell inequality, which is the CHSH inequality. So in this case, all pure states lead to no, uh, to no local correlations in the bipartite case. So now we somehow want to uh, ask Gisan's uh, question in the multipartite scenario. Uh, are all pure GME states genuinely multipartite non-local? And this is actually open, okay? Uh, soon after Gisan, what it was proved is that any pure GME empartite state is not fully local, okay? was actually some um, uh, small gap in the proof that was corrected uh, many years later, but the claim is still true. Uh, but this is only about full locality. We, we, never, we don't know if uh, any pure GME empartite state is genuinely multipartite or local. And hence, this is why it is not trivial to answer the question of, for the particular case of pure Penn state. Of Leo, course. can I have a question? Yes. So, what was the what was the uh, the gap in the proof by Popescu and Rolich? Well, remember? it was it was a very 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 technical thing uh, thing. I don't uh, uh, it, because the the proof has, uh, needs to assume that uh, there always exists a measurement by one party such mm -hmm. that it leaves uh, the 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 post measurement state for the other parties is entangled. And there was a, and this and this and there was the, the this part was not complete in there. They ignored some detail. It was something very technical, mm -hmm. which uh, Miami realized many years later because he needed it for some research he was doing. And uh, and then they correct. I mean, this the it's really it's mathematically it's not so it's um, not so. Um, deep but it's really the, the to fix the proof it really requires a lot of pages of uh of calculation to fix that detail mm -hmm. okay sorry so <clears throat> so as i said the extension of gsan's theorem to general uh, gme states so to pure states uh, it's still open. There are some partial uh, results. For instance, it is known that any three qubit pure GME state is GMNL, that any symmetric pure n qubit state uh, that is GME is also GMNL. There are, this is just uh, there are other partial results, but the general question is, is open. We don't. We are not considering the Gisan's theorem for, gen for general GME states. We are want to apply for a particular case of pure GME states, which is that of Penn states, okay? Uh, but there is also some, uh, some antecedent in the literature in the case of networks, which is uh, this work in the group of Tonya Thin uh, that shows that in the particular case of a star networks, okay? So you have the graph is a central node that shares an edge 
with all the satellite nodes. And in the particular case that the, the entanglements shared by the, by the parties are maximally entangled states, then this state is genuinely multipartite non-local. Okay? But you see, this only applies to a particular kind of graph and to a particular kind of pure states being shared, which is the maximally entangled state. Okay, so this was the question we wanted to answer, and this is the result that we obtained, which is, as you see, completely generalizes both to any kind of network and to any kind of, of entanglement, of pure entanglement shared, this previous result. We have that any connected pure bipartite state uh, network is GMNL, okay? So independently of the amount of entanglement shared, whether you share a maximally entangled state or a the state that has very few entanglement, as long as it is pure. And independently of the network topology, whether you have a star or whatever, then as long as it is connected, the corresponding state is genuinely multipartite or local. So you see this uh, completely answers the question for this ideal case of uh, pure network states, that not only GME, but they're also all GMNL, okay? As I said, I was only going to give very hand wavy ideas for the proof. So this, this proof is a bit lengthy, but just to give you an idea of how this works, very hand wavily, the idea is the following. So you start from your pen state, whatever it is, it is enough to consider any spanning tree. So, so at the end of the day, you just need to show that all trees are GMNL, and then anything that is not a tree can be transform into a tree just simply by neglecting some entanglement pairs, you just ignore them and you and you only act on some tree, okay, that, <coughs> that expands your graph. Okay, I'm, as I'm illustrating here in the simplest example of three parties. Okay. So, and then what you do is you consider now two inputs and two outputs for every particle, okay, but when I say for every particle, not party, remember there are parties that could hold many particles because they share some entanglement with different parties, okay? So in this particular example in here, party one would have two particles, one that is entangled with party two, the other one that is entangled with party three. And what the parties have to do is they, actually they have to measure locally the, the particles. So party one doesn't need to implement a joint measurement on the two particles she holds, just needs to implement one measurement in one particle and, and some other set of measurements in the other particle. So see, in this case, you will have two inputs and uh, sorry, four inputs and four outputs, okay? Two per party. And parties two and three have two inputs and two outputs. So in general, you see if a party I would have two to the power, the degree of the vertex in the three inputs and outputs. And you see, because Party one is not measured jointly her parties. Of course, the conditional probability distribution that arises from such a strategy factorizes in, in this splitting in here, okay? So like, like the, for the part that corresponds to the state psi between one and two and the part that corresponds to the state phi between one and three, okay? But you see, this doesn't mean that this probability distribution is bi-separable because it doesn't split in one versus two, three, or in two versus one, three, or in uh, three versus one, two. Okay? <coughs> and actually, this is enough. One can see that this uh, uh, conditional probability distribution happens to be genuinely multipartite non local. And the way one shows this is because now, because of Gisan's theorem, since psi and phi are pure states, we know that we can choose measurements such that phi psi is non-local and phi phi is non-local. Okay? And using this, we, we can come up with a construction of a GMNL Bell inequality using the bipartite uh, Bell inequalities that psi and phi can violate so that you, this, this shows that uh, GMNL is obtained. Okay? And actually, well, we had to construct explicitly this Bell inequalities was part of the work that we had to do. So I can explicitly give you the Bell inequality that shows that your pen state is non-local. But the techniques uh, built heavily on these uh, ideas and this work by Tony Athin as well. And I wanted to mention it here as well. Okay, so this is very roughly the idea of how one shows that uh, pure pen states are all uh, genuinely multipartite non-local. 
Can I have okay, a question, so Yes. <laughs> so for every network, you are able to construct a value inequality. This is violated by, by such product distributions. Not, not only for every network, but for every network, and depending on which states they share in the network. OK. So the inequality depends both on what is the network or what is the spanning tree that you choose and what are the uh, states shared in the edges. But, but is it like a sum of some tilted CHSH or something like that? Or Yes, it, it basically uh, one, uh, the idea is one uses uh, Hardy's paradox. Okay. And Hardy's paradox can be somehow messaged into a, a CHSH type inequality. This was the idea by Athene. And then somehow you 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 uh, how you call it? you leave these inequalities for more for the number of parties that you have. So basically, what you have is like a combination of CHSHs uh, along different cuts. Is roughly the idea. Okay, but this is this is then for like uh, qubit particles or? No, this the 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 parties could have the particles could have any dimension. This okay. is the state the states on the edges are completely arbitrary. Okay, and, and you said that in this paper that you cited here by Kurshot, Almeida, and Asin, it's like, so they map Hardy paradoxes to Berlin inequalities. Yes, they, uh, they somehow uh, rewrite Hardy's paradox as actually as a CHSH sort of, uh, sort of inequality, yes. Okay. Okay, so if there are no more questions, then as I was saying, this closes the ideal case where the parties share uh, pure states. But of course, this is not realistic. In, in general, one will always find that one has uh, mixed states because there is some noise. So now I want to move and, on and study the case of noisy networks. So now again, following this very schematic representation, now I change back from psi to rho, meaning that now they are sharing, uh, in principle, mixed states. Okay, well, of course, the previous result shows that mixed pen states can be GME and GMNL because the sets of GME and GMNL states are both open. So this means that these properties tolerate a certain amount of noise. Okay? So if I have here um, um, mixed states but are very, very close to pure states, I can tune, on, tune the parameters such that they are as close as I want to some pure state, then they will remain GME and even GMNL, okay? But what is not clear at all is to what extent they, they, they are robust, okay? How much noise one can put in there so that the GME or GMNL persists, okay? In particular, it is not clear at all whether as in the bipartite, in the pure state case, it happens that it is, if, whether it is sufficient to share bipartite entanglement in the connected network to guarantee that you have GME. In the case of the pure states, we see that no matter which, en which entangled states you put in the edges, as long as they are entangled, the, the, the overall state is GME. But is this true also true for the case of uh, mixed states? And if this is not the case, then this opens up the door to study how robust the GME property is with respect then to the quality of the bipartite entanglement and the geometry of the network. And if GME can be robust, then we can study whether GMNL is robust as well. And so again, how is it affected by the noise and the geometry? Okay, so this is what I'm going to discuss now. And in order to do so, I'm going to consider a very particular noise model. This is actually not really necessary. I mean, the, most of the results that I'm going to present now hold for more general noise models. But I think this keeps things, things simple and, and more simple to understand. It's also a very natural noise model, and this is what we are going to consider from now on. Okay? So the, the, what we are going to consider is that the mixed states that the parties uh, share have of a very particular form. They are going to be bidimensional isotropic states with visibility P. Okay? So this means convex combinations of the maximally entangled state in D dimensions and the completely mixed states of local dimension D as well, okay? Where P is the weight of the maximally entangled state and this is what we call the visibility. So you can, this is a very natural noise model. So you think we are trying to create the best possible state, a maximally entangled state, 
but we, we have some probability of failure and which this doesn't go well, then we have white noise, we have the maximal indexed state. These are, this is a well-studied family of states, initially by Michal and Pavel Horodetsky, as I, called, as I said, isotropic states, and among many of their properties, the, the, the value of the visibility, the threshold of the visibility that separates uh, separability and entanglement is well known. These states are entangled if the visibility is larger than this value here. Okay. <clears throat> and now, to even make things more simpler, of course, we could think that the parties one and two share an isotropic state with some visibility, and parties two and three share an isotropic state with another visibility, but this doesn't change much the, 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 the theory that we want to understand in here, and it's actually more convenient for the notation, and as I said, to keep things simpler. Then what we are going to consider is that all entangled pairs always share an isotropic state with the same local dimension and with the same visibility. Okay? It's like the, the parties got together, bought some machines that prepare isotropic states with a given visibility, and then they, they, they go out and they, they have these machines and they use them to entangle them with each other. And we want to see to which uh, degree they can obtain GME and GMN. Okay. So you see, then the state that I'm going to consider is well given a graph, okay, where the number of vertices is the number of parties, and the edges represent whether two parties are connected, whether two parties share an isotropic state of the given visibility P. I have the same visibility everywhere. Okay? So given a graph, this immediately and, and the value of the visibility of the visibility P, this defines my pen state that I call the n-partite d-dimensional isotropic pen state, which is given by this definition in here. So what we have is the R graph, and then every edge represents that the corresponding parties are sharing an isotropic state with visibility P, okay? So as I was saying at the beginning, now notice that the local dimensions depend on the degree of the vertex in the corresponding graph. Okay? So each party which will hold the degree of the vertex, num the, the, the number of qubits. Okay? So the local dimension for each party i is d to the power the degree of the, of the vertex of that part. Okay? <clears throat> okay, so these are the class of pen states that we are going to consider. These are going to be our noisy networks. And now we want to see when they are GME and, and if possible, GMNN. Okay. And <clears throat> as I said, it is with the case P equals one is the case of, uh, of pure states is when they share all share maximal entangled states. So we know that for P equals one, every connected graph has a GME. Okay. So now we want to see what happens when P is strictly smaller than one. Okay, how does GME depend on P and G? Okay? And in particular, as I said before, if all is it sufficient to share bipartite entangled states? If all nodes share bipartite entangled states, is the corresponding state always GME? Well, and it turns out that no, the answer is no. This is not the case. Okay. And I can actually this can actually be proven in the simplest case. Okay. So just consider three qubit isotropic paint states. Okay. So there are just three parties and they share two qubit isotropic states. If you think of three parties, then there are only two different graphs that one can consider, okay? Which is, that are connected, okay? Which is this one in here, which, uh, well, you can call the star, the line, well, I'm calling here a tree, because it's a tree. Or you have <coughs> a tree is a graph in which there are no, uh, no cycles. And the other pattern that you can have is the complete graph. Okay, this is the most connected graph. This is the graph in which every pair of um, uh, vertices is uh, connected by an edge. Okay, so actually, just studying this simplest case of three parties and the simplest dimension, d equals two, one can see that the fact that the parties uh, share isotropic entangled states doesn't mean that the overall state is genuinely multipartite entangled. Okay. So take for instance the case of the tree. Well, if P 
in this case, remember that the, the if you recall the previous slide, the threshold for separability and entanglement is one over d plus one. So in the case, d equals two is one over three. So of course, if p is less than or equal to one over three, in both cases, if they are sharing separable states, then the overall state is fully separable. Okay? But what one can show, and I'll give a bit of an idea of how we do this. Actually, we the way to prove this is using the definition of bi-separability. We explicitly construct a bi-separable decomposition of the state. One can see that even if you go beyond the entanglement threshold and take values of p larger than one over three, but smaller than this number in here, which is roughly 0.55, then this isotropic pen state is bi-separable, even the nodes are sharing entangled state. Okay. And actually using some different techniques, which are basically choosing cleverly some witness, one can show that nevertheless, this, the state is GME if P is large enough, in particular, if it's large than this number here, that is 0.58. So in general, to characterize when a state is separable or entangled is hard. You see here, we did not manage to close the gap. We don't know where exactly is the threshold that, uh, that separates by separability for GME. But it's, this is just the motivation. We'll go in deeper into the results later. What this shows, this does the job of what we wanted to see, is that sharing entanglement doesn't guarantee that you're going to have genuine multipartite entanglement. You need a certain quality in the visibility to have GME. And you can play the same game with a complete graph. And somehow expectedly, what you can see is that the same happens. There are values of the visibility in which the uh, parties are sharing bipartite entangled states, yet <coughs> the overall state is bi-separable. However, as you can see here, the threshold is lower. Okay? And actually, we can prove that in this case, we have GME if the visibility is larger than roughly 0.49. So you see, not only we learn that sharing bipartite entangled states is not enough to observe GME, but we see that this depends depends not only on the on the quality of the entanglement shared, which in this case is measured by the visibility, but also on the network topology. Okay? If I have a machine that uh, prepares isotropic states with visibility 0.5, if I uh, if I'm if I'm uh, if I have my network in the configuration of the tree, this doesn't lead me to having GME. But if I'm if I, I'm able to create more connections, then it pays off for this value of the visibility. If allows me to have GME. So uh, <coughs> you see, network topology can play a role in here. Okay, but this is just a bit of the motivation of of. Uh, so we see that there is some bridge theory behind in here that can be studied. Now we go like. No, Julio, to, did you did yes. you consider other pure states like mixtures of other pure states? Well, I guess that P would have to, I mean, the critical value of P for which the state is uh, GME would have to would increase, no? If you decrease the amount of entanglement in the pure state. Like, you mean like a mixture of another entangled state yes. and the identity? White noise, yes. Yes. Uh, yes, I'm, uh, uh, of course, yes, this happens. Uh, but actually, as I said, the results that I'm going to discuss now, which are the main results in, 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 this, in this paper, they don't really are, are not that sensitive to the noise model. So even if you have something like this, what I'm going to tell you now uh, after this slide it still holds true. Okay, The values of P can change a bit, but the, 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 the phenomenon that I'm going to describe later stays the same. Okay, so the question I'm going to ask now, which I think is makes more sense like from the... Um, from the application's point of view, okay? Okay, so as I write in here, every fixed network is, uh, is robust to some noise in showing GME. But what if our ability to create node-to-node -node entanglement is fixed to some, to some particular value of the visibility? Can we ensure GME for every network provided that the visibility is high enough, okay? So like I was saying before, if you just think of three parties, if, if, you, if I buy a machine whose visibility is promised to be 0.6, then I know that in any configuration, even in the tree, I can show GME. But this is only true for three parties. 
does this allow me to create GME for four parties? And if yes, for five parties and for 10 parties and for 100 parties. So basically what we were asking before is given G, we were looking at what is the optimal value P star, the threshold that tells me where is the change from biseparability to GME for the corresponding isotropic Penn state. Okay? Now what we are asking is given a fixed value of the visibility, given that someone gives me a machine with this visibility, now I want to know, okay, how can I use well this machine? For which graphs G is the corresponding isotropic Penn state GME? And in particular, so this is the key question in here. Now, does there exist a configuration such that for this fixed value of the visibility, the corresponding isotropic Penn state is GME for any system size? Can I use these machines to entangle in a genuine multipartite way than any number of parties, okay? And this is, uh, in principle, this is why it's not clear. Okay? <coughs> so this leads me to, to what I'm asking is whether GME can be asymptotically robust, or as we say here, if, if I can have asymptotic uh, survival of GME, okay? And so what I mean by this is given a sequence of graphs of N vertices, GN, we say that they display asymptotic survival of GME if there exists some value of the visibility, call it P0, which is independent on, of N. Okay, so I take the same value of P0 for the same for any N, it cannot depend on N, such that the corresponding isotropic Penn states for these graphs are GME for this value of the visibility for every N. Okay? So that independently of the number of parties, this value of the visibility is good enough. Okay? So you see, it could happen that a sequence doesn't have asymptotic survival of GME. This means that the threshold that separates uh, by separability from GME goes to one as n goes to infinity. And then for n large, if, if P is strictly smaller than one, if n is large enough, then they cannot be GME. On the other hand, you could have a sequence of graphs of configurations that do have asymptotic survival of GME. So this means that this threshold goes to something that is strictly less than one when n goes to infinity. So then above this limit for the values of the visibility that are above this number, then I could have GME for any number of parts. Okay? So this is somehow the question that, that we want to ask whether this can, act, whether this can happen. Okay? And this is not at all clear. Okay? There's only just one clear observation, okay? which of course is that more connected graphs have to be more robust, okay? because obviously deleting edges is an LOCC operation. So it maps by separable pen states into by separable pen states. Okay? So if I have a sequence of graphs, call it G prime, that I can obtain from another sequence G by deleting edges, then the threshold of G prime cannot be smaller than the threshold of G, okay? But this doesn't tell me anything about the asymptotic robustness. Of course, the only thing that I know is that if GN doesn't have asymptotic survival of GME, then G prime cannot have it either, okay? But as I was saying, okay, connectivity helps, okay? But this doesn't tell me whether, what is the answer to my question? Because you see, I have three possibilities, which are either, as you see here, it could be that asymptotic survival of GME is impossible. Okay? No sequence of graphs displays it. It could be that no matter which configuration you take, the threshold for all configuration tends to one, and then it is impossible. This, this, would, be, this would be a strong limitation to using uh, networks. Okay? If as, uh, as long as you have the slightest amount of noise, as long as you move away from the ideal case and you don't have pure states, no matter how small the noise is, then there would be an upper bound on how many uh, uh, parties you can have genuinely multipartite entangled, okay? Because the, uh, the, as soon as P is strictly smaller than one, then there is an upper bound on N in order to have GME. Or, it, so, I mean, of course, it could be that the P star would converge as lower for more connected networks, but at the end of the day, they would all converge to one. 
On the other hand, we could have the completely opposite and different case that asymptotic survival of GME, of GME could be universal, could be that all sequences displayed, okay? Of course, so now this means that all converge to something strictly less than one, okay? The, even the more connected the network, the most robust it is, and the, the lower is the number to which uh, the, the sequence converges. But at the end of the day, they are all potentially good if you have if your experimentalist is able to provide you a machine with a large enough visibility, then you can entangle as many parties as you want, as you want following a network. Okay. And then the third possibility that one could have is that asymptotic survival depends on the topology, okay? Depends on the configuration. Some sequences might display it, but others don't, okay? And if this is the case, then this points are a fundamental property of networks. There is a fundamental difference between them, okay? There are some networks which are fundamentally limited. You cannot entangle as many parties as you want uh, whenever your visibility is not perfect and in which others you can do it, okay? So this is the question that we want to answer, okay? And as we said, the only thing that we know is that connectivity can help. The, 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 visibility, the threshold visibility for more connected sequences has to be smaller or equal than the one of less connected one. Okay? So how, can, how could we answer this question? Okay? Well, in principle, if I want to, if it, if it turns out that we have case one, if asymptotic survival is impossible, well, in principle, it's hard. We have to show it for every, we have to show that it's impossible for every sequence. But actually, the following observation, which is some of the ideas we are going to use in the proofs, allows it to show it in a much simpler way because it is actually enough to show it for one single sequence, okay? And that is the sequence of the completely connected graph of, of n vertices, okay? Because this is the most connected graph and by this observation, if this sequence doesn't have asymptotic survival, then no sequence can have it. So actually, in, in order to answer the question, if it turned out to be case one, it is enough to check what happens to the sequence of completely connected graphs, okay? Now suppose it turns out that the answer is two, that as in terms of survival is universal, how could I show this? Well, now I'm in the, in the opposite way. If all the sequences display it, even the least connected ones have to display it. And it is enough to see that the least connected sequences display it because if the least connected sequences display it by this observation, the more connected sequences display it as well. So if it, the answer happens to be case two, then it is enough to prove that all three sequences have asymptotic survival. So this observation doesn't answer the question, but it helps me in answering. So it, I only need to look at what happens at the sequence of completely connected graphs or at sequences of three graphs. What happens in uh, case three? Uh, sorry, Julio, just yes. one question. Uh, yes. Like how you measure, I mean, okay, I understand that complete graph is the like the most connected one. Uh, I guess you are, you want to study uh, connected graphs. So uh, why do you have like, just intuitively, I would think that's like a line is, uh, is the least connect. Okay, like, so in what's, like what partial order you are taking when you, well, I, I'm, I'm talking a bit on, on a hand wavy way, okay? But the, the partial order is given by the observation that I have in here. If I can obtain one graph from another graph by deleting edges, mm -hmm. then, it, then it cannot be more robust to noise than the, than the original one, okay? So you see every three graph, can, any, any graph which is not a tree, can be mapped into a tree okay. by deleting edges. Gotcha. Okay. Answer? Uh, yes, 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 it's cute. So in other words, like every, yeah, because every connected graph has a spanning tree, so you can just delete some of the edges and you exactly. uh, yeah. land in some tree, so it's- And on the other hand, from the completely connected graph, I can obtain any graph that I want by deleting some edges. Thanks. Okay. So if it turns out that the answer to the question is option three, then I know where to look. It has to be that the uh, sequence of completely connected graphs has asymptotic survival, while some, at least one three sequence does not have it. Okay. 
So the result I'm going to present now, you, you see, is, is not uh, focused on the co completely connected graph has this property or, or three sequences have this property. What I want is to answer this question, this fundamental question that I was explaining here. And for me, it is the tool to answer them whether asymptotic survival is impossible, universal, or depends on the graph. Okay. And actually, well, I'm uh, going to reveal I hope I created enough suspense what the answer is. The answer is three, okay? The, it happens that, so there is a fundamental difference between uh, networks for this purpose. One show absentee survival, what the others don't. Okay. And actually, so for, uh, for, the, for this, it, as I said, it's enough to prove this. And actually, it is not that uh, there is a tree sequence that doesn't have asymptotic survival. Actually, the first thing that one can prove is that any sequence of trees doesn't have asymptotic survival of GM. Okay? And this is a consequence of the following theorem that I said in here. So if I have any tree graph of n vertices, then the corresponding isotropic Penn state is biseparable if this inequality holds. So you see, as long as P is smaller than one, then if N is sufficiently large, then this, the this corresponding uh, overall network state is for sure by several. Okay. okay, so you see this in principle is, is this is bad news. This, this means that the, these uh, poorly connected networks are bad. They have a fundamental limitation. And actually, what is the first scheme, the first idea that comes to one's mind if you want to create GME? Well, the, this would be the first idea. I think the most natural idea is, well, you have a, a powerful central laboratory that prepares the GME state that you want to have. Then the central laboratory somehow manages to share quantum channels with the other parties and then sends to the parties the, the corresponding share of the state using these quantum channels. Okay? This, I guess, is the, the basic and the most natural idea and the, world, the one that is most used in experiments okay? to prepare a GME state. Well, what this, this is a particular case of a tree and what this result shows is that these, uh, these uh, protocols are doomed to failure, okay? Because since this is a tree, so unless the, the quantum channel that you have here is perfect, you have um, um, a maximally entangled state, so you can teleport perfectly, as long as you have the slightest amount of noise, and this is what is going to happen in reality, then you cannot entangle as many parties as you want and create GME. There is an upper bound to the number of parties that can show GME. So for instance, in this setting, take for instance, the visibility to be quite large, 0.95, which is uh, some experimentally competent value of the visibility. Then this uh, result in here immediately tells you that more than 38 parties cannot be GME uh, using the, this uh, central laboratory paradigm. Okay? And this is just, this is just a, an estimate. I know for a fact that this bound could be improved. Maybe I can say a bit about this later. So probably the number of parties that can share GME with this value of visibility is, is considerably smaller. Okay? So this, as I was saying, this shows a fundamental limitation for preparing GME following these network patterns for any, any tree-shaped uh, network. On the other hand, as I was saying, uh, the, the asymptotic survival of GME depends on the topology. So there has to be another sequence of graphs that displays asymptotic survival of GME. And this, uh, we are able to show this by showing that the sequence of complete graph displays uh, asymptotic survival of GME. Okay? So uh, <clears throat> actually, <clears throat> We can even estimate this value of P naught. Okay, so the, I can tell you that if you have machines of this visibility, then you can entangle as many particles as you want, and it's GME as long as you create a fully connected graph. Okay? I'm not. I, I'm going to give a value for the equals two. Is I mean, I the the proof is constructive. I could give it for any d. The problem is that the the estimate is the solution of a transcendental equation, and I cannot be a simple expression for it. But uh, for d equals two, so if the particles are sharing qubits, I know for I know that the that if your p is this if is above 0.865, then you can entangle as many parties 
as you want uh, following the fully connected graph and you, what you will have is GME. So you see the estimate is, as we did not even optimizing it, but you see it's not 0.9999. So this really within values that are uh, achievable in current experiments. So you have a visibility of 0.9 is good enough. Okay, so from these two theorems, as I was discussing, then you have as a corollary the result that we wanted to prove. And this is our main result here. So I was saying asymptotic survival of general multipartite entanglement in noisy quantum networks depends on the topology, depends on the connectivity of the underlying graph. Okay, so let me give a, a brief idea of how these uh, results are proven because I think I'm, I'm running out of time. So the first one is here. So actually what I'm going to give you is an idea of uh, how one shows this, okay? That the, the, the three qubit uh, tree is by separable if P is smaller than this. And, 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 and what we do in this theorem is generalize this construction for any, any tree of uh, no matter how many parties, okay? So just for simplicity, think that we have the, uh, the three part type. Uh, so we have three parties and they are sharing and they are, the, we, so we have the isotropic pain state corresponding to a tree of three parties, okay? So how one can see whether this is bi-separable or not? So what we do is, well, expand, remember rho of P is the isotropic state of visibility P is P times phi plus, plus one minus P times the identity, okay? The identity with the tilde is the normalized identity, identity over D squared, okay? So if you expand this, then you get with weight P squared, sharing in the, with the same pattern of the tree, phi plus and phi plus. Or with, with this weight, phi plus between one and two and the normalized identity between two and three and so on. Identity phi plus and identity identity, okay? Now, if you think about it, these three states in here, they are already bi-separable, okay? Because here they are just sharing the identity. This is actually fully separable. Here, parties one and two are sharing the identity. So this state in here, is separable in the partition one versus two, three. While this state in here is separable in the partition one, two versus three, because two and three share the identity. So these states in here are already by separable. Okay? So now what I have to do is mix this state in here, which is the only one that is GME, in such a way that I obtain a by separable state. Okay? And what we do is take one half of the weight that you have for this state, so P squared over two, and mix it with this state in here. This is not normalized. Right? If you renormalize, do you see what happens is since part is one and two and both sharing phi plus, what I get is a convex combination of phi plus and the identity for parties two and three, which is an isotropic state. So what happens is this is gives me this, where two and three all share an isotropic state where the noise has changed, okay? Hence, now if P, if this number is smaller or equal to one over d plus one, which is the same as saying that p is smaller or equal to two over d plus two, then this state is a bi-separable state. And of course, I, with the other half of the weight, p squared over two, I take this and I mix with the other guy in here. And by the same argument, but now due to symmetry, I obtain the isotropic state in here. And this will also be bi-separable if p is less or equal than two over d plus two. So you see this state, if this inequality is fulfilled, then it's by separable, okay? And you see, if you write D equal to two, then you get one over two. So basically this argument, what shows is that this state in here is by separable if P is smaller than one over two than 0 0.5. Actually, what we did here is something a bit better because here I could get another fraction of this state and mix it with this state in here that I didn't touch. And then this manages to give me a slightly higher visibility where the state is still being bi-separable. But actually what we do here is the simplest construction. And this is what I know that this bound for sure is just an estimate that can be improved, okay? So now the proof of this theorem is just generalizing this idea of, uh, of uh, recombining the terms when you have an arbitrary tree in there, okay? This is roughly the idea. Okay, and for theorem two, what we have to show is that the sequence of complete graphs 
displays a symptomatic survival of GME. And how do we do this? Well, the, again, uh, summarizing a lot of technical details into one slide, the idea is in these two lemmas. Okay, so first, what we prove is, an, uh, is a bound that all biseparable states have to obey. And then we show that, that the uh, corresponding isotropic states for complete graphs violate this bound. Okay? So the, idea, the, the, the first bound for, for biseparable states is the following. So basically, uh, so what we denote by phi plus ij, the maximally entangled state shared by parties ij. And now consider some arbitrary LOCC protocol that maps your impartite state into a bipartite state shared by party I and J. And suppose that with this, uh, with this LOCC map, what you want to do is get something as close as possible to the maximally entangled state for parties I and J. And for any choice of parties, you can change your map and try to do the best LOCC map that maps your state into the maximal entangled state for those parties. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> what happens for bisoparable states is that you cannot do this perfectly for all particle pairs. Okay. So you take the sum over all particle pairs over all ij, and you just take the average. There are n times n minus one over two particle pairs. So hence this number in here. What one can show is that the fidelity cannot be as close to one as you want because since the idea is because they are biseparable. Maybe if for some particle pairs, you can get a perfect maximally entangled state, but then in, for some other pair, you have to do it very badly because this state is biseparable. Okay? So the average fidelity with which you can create a maximally entangled state for any pair is bounded away uh, from one by this bounding here. Okay? This happens for any biseparable state. And uh, now what happens is that <coughs> what one can show is that if you have the isotropic pen state corresponding to the completely connected graph for a fixed value of the visibility smaller than one and n sufficiently large, then you can violate this bound. So I can find an LOCC protocol such that for any pair ij, I can get a maximally entangled state with fidelity larger than this value. And the idea is roughly uh, depicted in here. So suppose here I have four parties, I have the completely connected graph for four parties. And now what I'm going to do is, well, all edges that uh, do not uh, start or the, that are not adjacent to I or J, I don't, I'm not going to use them, so I can discard them. In this case, there's just this edge in here. So I only keep the edges that are adjacent to I or M or J. And now what I'm going to do is, you see, so if you take any, any other vertex, it is, it, since this is the complete graph, it's going to be adjacent to I and to J, okay? So now what I'm going to do is use the isotropic state that they share as a quantum channel in order to teleport the isotropic uh, state this party shares with I. So at the end of the day, I, tele I use this as a channel, I teleport this state. So now I and J end up sharing some more state. And I do this for all the vertices, okay? So at the end of the day, then I and J, I'm going to end up after this teleportation uh, process, sharing N pairs or N minus one uh, pairs of noisy isotropic states. Of course, since they are not sharing a maximal entangled state, the teleportation is noisy. And then what, I'm, what they are going to end up sharing is an even noisier isotropic state. But if the original noise was large enough, this, this final states in here are going to still have a visibility large enough so that I can uh, implement the last step, which is now take all these copies of noisy isotropic states and distill them into the maximally entangled state. Okay? It is well known for that all isotropic states are distillable, so if the noise remains large enough, <coughs> then I can distill them to the state phi plus. And now the only question remaining there, which was something I didn't know until I had to solve this problem, which is, okay, then we, if you know about distillation, then you know that if the state is distillable, then it can be transformed to phi plus with fidelity approaching one as n goes to infinity. But this also happens in here. So for us, it was a question of how fast this happens. Well, it turns out that if you use certain protocols, then you can show 
that the fidelity with which you uh, approach the maximal entangled state goes to one exponentially in n. And hence, you can beat this bound, which is only, uh, it goes to one as one over n. And this uh, somehow uh, completes the proof at, at this hand wavy uh, uh, level. Um, sorry, but this is for GME, not uh, for uh, non-locality. This is for GME, yes. Okay, okay. So, uh, so, so far I have only, uh, you see my result has been, here is the asymptotic survival of GME depends on the topology. I have not said anything about GMNL so far. Okay. <laughs> Well, yeah, I think we should conclude because uh, you are going to pick up your baby from the kindergarten, no? So. Yes, so also I, I had here a third part of the talk, which I'm then going to skip, which uh, just very briefly want to mention that another reason why we study Penn States is because they provide a very useful tool to better understand multipartite entanglement and non-locality using the much better developed bipartite theories. So I'm very just skipping all the details, I'm going to quickly tell you that using Penn states, it still remains open if all GME and partite states are GMNL, but what we can show is that if a finite number of copies of any pure state are available, then they display GMNL. Then for those of you who know what it is, then can not only follow these uh, results that construct GME states that are not GMNL for a number of parties, but show a new construction of these states that moreover show that they can be super activated for any number of parties. And, uh, and then well, with this, I really don't have that much time. So I'm, I'm going to skip this uh, last result. So I'm just quickly going to jump then to the conclusions. So uh, I hope I have convinced you that uh, uh, Penn states provide an experimentally feasible way of preparing non-classical multipartite quantum states. We have seen that pure networks are always GME and GMNL independ independently of the amount of entanglement shared on the network topology. And that uh, mixed networks can exhibit GME or GMNL, but this depends on the amount of entanglement shared and the network topology, okay? What we have uncovered is that there is an extreme fundamental difference. Asymptotic survival is possible in highly connected configurations, while it is impossible in poorly connected configurations. Okay, so this leaves open a, a, a clear. This I think there is a clear open question in here that I would like to answer: Is can we have asymptotic survival of GME for moderately connected networks? So if I pay the full price of uh, buying machines for everybody so they can all connect to each other, then I can entangle uh, as many parties as I want. If I'm, if I, in other cases I can't, but can I, so do I really need to go to the completely connected configuration or can I find something cheaper which still displays asymptotic survival of GME? And then going a bit into the question by Michal, uh, of course, if, if something is not GME, then it cannot be GMNL. Okay? So the impossibility of asymptotic survival of GME implies the impossibility of asymptotic survival of GMNL. But for those networks in which asymptotic survival of GME is possible, like the completely connected configuration, is asymptotic survival of GMNL possible as well? Does it occur for all networks that have asymptotic survival of GME? Or for some it does, but for others it doesn't. Okay, and this part, I, unfortunately, I had to skip. Let me just briefly mention that an, another good thing about Penn States is that they constitute a, 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 a nice tool that exploits the uh, well-known theory of bipartite entanglement of, and bipartite non-locality. And then they provide a toolkit to uh, prove results about uh, multipartite non-locality and, and multipartite entanglement that, uh, that were unknown by exploiting this uh, underlying bipartite structure like the ones you see here in the screen. But I'm well uh, past my time, so I'm going to leave it here. I'm sorry for taking so much time and thank you for your attention. Hey, thanks for your, for your nice talk. Uh, do you have time for, for some questions or? Yes, yes, I have like 10 minutes. Okay, so do you people have questions? I 
I actually have a question or maybe okay. more a bit of a suggestion. Have you looked at random graphs where you have a connection with some probability? Yes, well, actually, this is a good question, but this is actually, in a certain case, this is what we consider because you see, if I consider the if a completely connected uh, uh, isotropic uh, pen state, well, Here, so basically, what you see, what is it's it's like a random graph. What I'm saying is, with probab, you can think of this as a random graph with probability p. I create the maximally entangled state, and then this is like it is connected, and with probability one minus p, I have white noise, and then this is not connected. So actually, a, a, a way to approach these problems is by thinking of this like random graphs. Okay, yeah, I haven't thought of that. The other question would be if you restricted the operations just to some local operations without communication so that you cannot have uh, teleportation mm -hmm. in the setting. Or likewise, kind of, even if you allowed for teleportation, then clearly you can use every maximum entangled state only once. So you cannot do a complete kind of broadcasting of an arbitrary state, which was prepared at one local node mm -hmm. to all the other nodes. If you don't have sufficient kind of, a, you would need a multigraph in that sense that you have shared more entangled pairs in order to get everything through in teleportation. Yes. So that's still a little bit uh, unclear to me what operations you allow and what you are excluding in your setting? Well, the operation that I allow is very clear. It's LOCC. Okay, so the parties can do local operations and classical communication is for free. What is true here, so if we go back to this initial motivation slide where I said that pen states are sufficient for all purposes because starting from them, I can prepare any state by LOCC. If you somehow cut the kind of operations that you can do, you further limit them, and you don't allow classical communication, then it is known, and this is a result by Miguel Navas Cues and, and, and other people, that they show that if you only use uh, local operations and share randomness, but you don't allow classical communication, then these are not universal resources. There are states, like for instance, like the GFZ state, that can never be prepared by distribution, distributing bipartite entanglement and using local operations and shared randomness. So you no, need the classical communication. If you just look at this particular graph, if you have that graph on six nodes and you just have one EPR pair between any kind of a yes, corresponding to any edge. Then clearly you cannot prepare arbitrary six qubit states by sure, sure, sure. So this is why I said this is why I say here, if the quality of non entanglement is good enough, if maximally if you have maximal entangled states of sufficiently large dimension. Yeah, but uh, kind of you need high dimension maximal entangled states to prepare a qubit state. And then you are switching kind of dimensions. Yes. So I, I'm a little bit kind of concerned that you start with a fixed dimension, but then you allow to reduce the dimension in the states you're preparing. Or the no. other way around, you start with something higher dimensional in order well, to- I can, I can use a, uh, can use a, uh, Q quart state to teleport a Q treat, no? Uh, uh, of course you can, but in terms of resources, if you say I'm starting with a fixed state of fixed dimensions, but then you can only prepare lower dimensional states. Yes. So yes, yeah, I mean this is this is just the I, I would like just a motivation dimensions. slide. Okay, so you are totally right, but what I said is if you have sufficient if the quality of node to node entanglement is good enough, then you could prepare any empire state of some fixed dimension that you want. 
this is just as a motivation that these are good states, okay? At the end of the day, this is irrelevant for the results I'm presenting. Yeah, but to some extent, you could boost your fidelity of the states then also by distillation. In which context? You could apply entanglement distillation in order to improve the quality. With the similar argument, you just allow more copies to start with. But, but uh, in which context do I use this? So, uh, sorry, I'm a bit confused because I don't know to which uh, part of my talk your question applies. Kind of more the general setting, kind of a, when you later say, okay, I have a certain quality of my kind of entanglement between the states. Hmm. Then I can also increase the quality by entanglement distillation. If I allow for a higher local dimension to start with. Well, uh, this is not true because in a certain sense, uh, you cannot increase entanglement by LOCC. Yes, if I allow LOCC and if I allow arbitrary kind of initial, or say not arbitrary, I still have to put a bound, but if I allow, say, to have 10 entangled pairs shared to start with, then I can apply entanglement distillation and I can improve the quality of a single EPR pair distilled out of the 10 I start with. Of course, it does not change whether I can asymptotically reach one or not, but it changes the thresholds you're computing. No. No, no. I'm not sure I understand what you're talking about, but if you are talking about the thresholds now, uh, this, this is a given state, okay? So this is a state, this is a state that only depends on some parameter P, and there is one threshold that from which this state goes from being bisepal to being GME, and this is, doesn't depend on anything. This is, uh, this, you have a, you have a so state- but entanglement distillation, Marcus, Marcus, I'm sorry, but maybe someone else has a question. <clears throat> Is there anyone who'd like to ask a question? I had an impression that someone wanted to ask a question. Well, I mean, just maybe one comment, I guess the concern of Marcus was that like, that you treat uh, for your the, uh, dim like local dimension as kind of like a free parameter, but maybe it's, it would be kind of more natural to I don't know, have it fixed and kind of go with, and to infinity or something like this. No, no, this fix. This is fine. Yeah. So when I talk about here asymptotic survival, you, you take D to be fixed. Okay. And, and then okay, I, ha I have one practical, uh, uh, like some practical question. So, I mean, well, semi practical. So you, you have this uh, notion of genuine multipartized locality. So, do I, if I understand well, for pure states, uh, Coming from those graphs, you have uh, by uh, do you have bow inequalities actually? Okay. Yes. So so the, the, the proof that these states are GMNL is it's uh, it's constructive and we explicitly provide the Bell inequality for okay. depending on the state. And then so 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 then I like just if I were to implement it like in a in the, in the lab, whatever, like I could, uh, I could just run this bell inequality and sort of uh, provided my noise is low enough, it, it would be, I mean, just qualitatively without giving the quantitative. So, say again, what is the question? Sorry. So my question, so, so, okay, it's more like a comment. So because this, I mean, this bell inequality one can construct it. So then if one runs the actual experiment on a noisy device and let's say, the inequality is violated, then one can just conclude that this, like, that there yes. was genuine multipartite entanglement in the state, for example. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which is nice. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that, okay, just one more question for me. So, like, did, did you think about, like, some experiment, like, some physical setups where, or when you would like to run those things? Uh, those, uh, no, not really. I mean, we are really investigating this from the purely theoretical point of view, trying to see what we wanted to see is whether some networks are more advantageous than others. And then 
it's let's say the experimentalists who have to think whether this net because of course uh, the first thing an experiment is going to tell me is well the completely connected graph is really demanding so sure I, what we would like to think is to find a graph that is moderately connected that still has this property of asymptotic survival but i'm not thinking of concrete implementations uh... mm -hmm. okay uh... so, so maybe Thanks. last last uh, one question <clears throat> so you have this result that if you take n minus one copies of n partite state then uh, which is uh, gme then the resulting state is GMNL, no? Yes. And I remember this, this is when I had to start running it. Yes. So did you did you have any improvement on the number of copies here? I mean, no. Uh, the, I I I can tell you something. So I a finite number of copies is enough. And I can tell you that if the state is impartite n minus one surface, it could be that you can do it with less. It could be that you can do it with just one copy, that all GME mm -hmm. states are GMNL, but I don't know. Okay, but you don't have any example of a state that if you take N minus two copies or something, then you cannot uh, prove it. No, no, because the, the question remains open. It could be that all GME, mm -hmm. all pure GME states are GMNL, and hence one copy is enough. While the question remains open, what I can tell you, my result in here is that well, at least n minus one copies work. Okay, thank you, Julio, once more. Thank you very much. Sorry thank for you. running so long. <laughs> no, that's, that, that's fine. So I hope we will see each other soon in, uh, in real. Thank you once again. Thank, thank you, you for coming. Bye. See you.